What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 201 at block height 606,960 on Friday, December 6th, 2019. That took me a second. So, um, surprise, bitches! Rick is back! Oh, man. Yeah, I made it back, man. Uh, just an episode too late. I watched episode 200 and, and just kind of was baffled that i had fallen that far out of the bubble to where i was like 200 happened man i uh should have been there i'm sorry it was good to see chris was back for that episode and uh yeah it's good to be back right here right now so uh yeah it's a pretty good friday so far the weather's nice out here in colorado still how are you doing today janine i'm in complete darkness but that's <laughs> that's another that's a story for another time uh, but yeah how many we had a thing going uh, while you were gone, like, uh, instead of Reckless, we were saying Rickless. How many Rickless episodes did we have? I guess in total that must have been five, huh? Four or five? What is, how many? Uh, I think my at least brain ten. doesn't organize things in rational ways like numbers and counting. Yeah, it could have been closer to 10 because all I know is that, yeah, over the past two months, I've not really stopped working out until just recently. And it has been like two months. And that all kind of started right whenever I was uh, taking that hiatus. So, yeah, it could have been all the way up to damn near 10 episodes. But, it, yeah, we're back back now, man. It's good to be back. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I probably should catch you guys up on. I know that uh, whenever I was leaving, I said that I was going to be flying down to Mexico to speak with Google or at a Google campus about Bitcoin. Well, they uh, canceled all of that like just a week out whenever I started asking questions about flights and hotels and everything. And they said, yeah, you're supposed to pay for the first three or something. And then I started looking more into the whole program there that they were doing as far as this Google Grow program and yeah, and it just like it just looked shady. It kind of looked like they were just funding a bunch of political action committees for next year's election, and it just I don't know, man. Google itself, the whole thing gives me the I just didn't like it. And so once it kind of faded out, I was somewhat satisfied and happy about it, but like also kind of bummed about not traveling. But that's all right. I just kept focusing in on the gym and uh, working on that other podcast, which I am still doing. I don't know if this microphone sounds, uh, you know, you might be able to hear me a little bit better because I've been working on that setup, but it's still getting the formatting right on all that. So, yeah, this is a quick update as far as, like, what's been going on, I guess, with me. Yeah, fuck Google, dude. You know, they're, wow. like, they're shady fucking pieces of shit. Uh, end of story. The, the entire way that went. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, that's what we were kind of saying from the beginning, but I am a bit surprised that they showed their true colors so quickly. <laughs> that's kind of, yeah. Yeah, after being just even close to that whole situation, I've started to realize now just how overly gross big Google is that nobody's in control of any of these. Like, there's like these projects, and then there's people that get put in charge of these different projects, and then they get handed off to other people. And, like, there's just these big projects that are moving forward and, you know, people that are just custodials of, like, what Google wants to create. And, like, it could fall to the wayside or it could be something. And it's just a monstrosity of a company. Like, that company really freaks the hell out of me, especially being here in Boulder and, you know, what they're doing with this, like, this grow program. And they're trying to teach people and they're just getting a little too big. but. Yeah, enough about them, man. Like, uh, what, what's up? What's been up with you guys? I know that Bitcoin's been going a little, uh, 
a little sideways, choppy this way, that way. But the news has been, I don't know, relatively calm, I, except for recent scams have been going a little crazy, I guess, with Richard Hart and, I don't know, Tron went a little nuts. But I guess we can get to that. That's all in the news. But, uh, yeah, what's been going on, man? Uh, just uh, the price went up, down, it went up again. Um, I don't know. Maybe it'll go down again. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could count on that. It will go up. It will go down again. That's uh, one thing there. Doesn't matter what the hell you're doing. Bitcoin's gonna be doing its own thing. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, you guys want to just get right into the, the news of the day. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Take us to it. All right. Uh, so this is going to be one of those rare times where I say, even after you hear me talk about this, um, go to the full source um, that I'm pulling from and, and listen to this whole thing. But, um, you know, I, I noticed a while back that Nick Carter started a podcast called, um, oh my God, I knew I was going to forget the name again. Um, yeah. Okay. It's a really not... Uh, the kind of name you'd expect in the space. I'll remember it in a, in a little bit. Uh, on on the brink, uh, yeah, uh, or no, yeah, on the brink with Castle Island. I think is the name. But okay, now that that's uh, fully coherently out of my mouth, um, he he did a recent episode, uh, his most recent one, with the former head of the Circle OTC desk, which was the like second biggest OTC desk in America. It was a massive part of, of the overall crypto markets. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing. It's, it's a really interesting interview. If you want to hear how that whole business built up and, and a lot of kind of the, the back scene stuff in, in the OTC markets, like listen to it. But I kind of want to go to um, some comments he made about Tether in the interview. Um, and it, it's pretty much just complete and utter evisceration, end of story, with the, the entire Bitfinex FUD. Um, so he, again, I will remind you, he's the head of the Circle OTC desk at the time. He pretty much built the entire OC, or OTC desk out himself. And being the second biggest OTC desk during the 2017 run-up, like there's a massive insight into what's actually going on in the market. And so the, the entire kind of period that you see massive increases in tethers and circulation and all the accusations began, sorry, one second, um, about just tether being printed out of thin air to pump the price up. Uh, this guy was literally there on this OTC desk handling the bank wires going back and forth for tens of hundreds of millions of dollars of actual money to redeem and, and get Tether issued. And the entire thing that kicked off the massive spike in uh, the, the Tether issuance in the first place was Coinbase. Um, pretty much getting massive growth and volume and ev everybody going to Coinbase to buy Bitcoin and just mooning the price up so that there was a huge premium uh, at Coinbase versus Bitfinex. And so all of these people were just running this massive ARB, like get Tether, buy Bitcoin on Bitfinex, move the Bitcoin and sell it to Coinbase get that cash out of Coinbase as fast as possible back into Tether and then repeat the entire cycle until it got to the, the point where Bitfinex had a premium. But th that entire period, he was personally on the Circle OTC desk handling bank wires with tens, hundreds of millions of dollars of cash, redeeming and getting Tether issued with real money. And the funny part is the entire thing that, that led to that massive increase in the use of Tether was just purely organic demand on Coinbase, creating that premium that made this arbitrage so profitable between Bitfinex and Coinbase. 
And the the big reason, like nobody stepped out, like Circle didn't step out and, and, and say anything. Why none of the other exchanges or OTC desks doing all the same shit during this whole period have not stepped up and said anything publicly is because they didn't want the bad press. They didn't want the New York Attorney General breathing down their neck and causing problems for this shit. And he, during this, this interview with Nick Carter, he goes into like how that was a huge internal talking point at the Circle OTC desk. Like, why aren't we stepping out and just calling bullshit on this FUD? Because we know it's bullshit. And it was the, the, the fear of the government stepping in and fucking with you based on this bullshit, pure and simple. And the only reason this guy is going on record now is because he, he's left Circle. He isn't there anymore. And is just why not? But like this, like, you know, inside info and perspective from one of the guys running these OTC markets, which is where all this massive tether demand came from. It just, it just blows that entire narrative completely out of the water on every level. Well, that's good to see. I mean, somebody else trying to say that, uh, you know, the whole tether thing is a bunch of smoke with no real fire because, uh, I mean, that's something that we've been saying for years now. So I guess, you know, it's good that somebody else comes forward and says like that this is, uh, this is something that everybody's just sort of been gassing about where I was actually hand over fist with the actual cash. So yeah, I get a little bit more I guess, uh, trust there with Tether to where people aren't going to be bashing it too much. But, uh, yeah, every time Tether comes up, I tell people, like, you know, it's the one, it's the, as far as stable coins go, I mean, it's the most trusted one out there. I mean, like, you know, now you got insiders from Circle coming out saying, like, look, I was handling the actual cash that these Tethers were backed up with. It's not even just some bank official saying, like, yeah, I've seen the account. It's like, this guy was dealing the cash. Mm -hmm. And, you know, another interesting part about that is like Nick kind of asked him why he thinks like Tether is still the stable coin everybody wants to use. And, you know, his, this guy's response was pretty much, you know, it's, it's all this massive demand in Asia right now. And the reason that they're happy with Tether is because like, think about what Coinbase and Circle would do with USDC if the US government said freeze and give us this money or like stop this or that or you know this person's stuff. They would just do it, hands down. Whereas Tether will fight that tooth and nail every way they possibly can. You know what I mean? Like that the they as a company will actually defend from seizure their customers backing assets as absolutely far as they can whereas all the other stable coin issuers out there would just roll over in a heartbeat and it's like i i've never thought about things from that perspective before but it makes absolutely perfect sense yeah i mean you go to the choke points and tether's choke point is not as easily identifiable as somebody like uh gemini dollar or usdc it's like uh, it's very easy to know where you're going there Mm -hmm. all right nah janine if we can't pry a comment out of you uh i guess we'll slide into the next one which is kind of both related uh to to the the circle otc desk lead going on record um and also just epically hilarious so there is now a response uh to Tether's pre-motion letter to have the trillion dollar lawsuit dismissed against them. And they are refusing to amend or alter uh, the, the complaint in any way whatsoever. And, and go on to argue that all of the, the amendings and changes to the study that they cite um, verifying tethers being printed out of thin air to manipulate the market um don't matter um at all to their assertions and actually still assert that a single person was manipulating the bitcoin market and overall crypto market with usdt by printing it <laughs> and um just lays out the the state of where they're at as far as serving all of the the plaintiffs in this suit and they're they're gonna keep trying to push forward with this and it's just like 
you know, the timing could not be more fucking perfect with the the head of the the Circle OTC desk or former head going on record with all of this shit uh, with Nick Carter. When it's like, you know, how much more of an effort or a, a leap and a jump is it to give testimony in court? or provide banking records for shit or how or think about how many other people in this industry are in the position to do that like this this lawsuit is is just like there is absolutely no way anything happens ruling against finex or tether out of this lawsuit it's insane yeah i mean it's really hard to i don't know you know, a trillion dollars against this company where it's like you're looking at, I mean, you know, we got in the story lineup, you know, Bitfinex is doing some pretty technical stuff with this uh, technology. They're moving forward with the highest speed stuff and uh, Tether's not far behind them, you know, like we're saying, they're the most trusted stable coin out there between the exchanges and like uh, between exchanges. And it's also just like, um, yeah, I mean, it's moving towards a federated system that's also more audible and more technical technically sophisticated to do its job i mean where you're talking about some new york attorney general's office and a trillion dollars and one person's controlling the price of bitcoin i mean it's like it's <laughs> yeah it's like uh i don't know it's like a conspiracy theorist for sure mm-hmm. and i mean you know it's you know just to think back for a second i mean just think about how fucked up that is like all, all of this stuff we know about Circle OTC and, and a little bit about other businesses in the space now, that none of them during all of that stepped up and called bullshit because they were scared the government would fuck with them if they became publicly associated in any way with Tether. Like, that's fucked up. Yeah, I mean, this is, I don't know, man, this whole lawsuit with tether i mean this is going to be a never-ending thing this is going to be like where the traditional sector fights the uh crypto sector you know (laughs) there's going to always be this people fighting and uh you know these narratives building about well you can't trust this because it's all that and you know they want to pick out just the thing that they can say point to and say well this is controlling it because that's where the volume is and you know it's getting issued nobody knows what it's like well yeah it's anarchy it's crypto anarchy like uh, it's not your thing Mm -hmm. but i guess uh yeah you know that that uh done and settled is one of the few times i have ever enjoyed talking about tether like we're gonna talk a few times yeah that's not settled we will hear about tether again (laughs) (laughs) but uh yeah uh, janine uh you want to take us into the update on what's going on with virgil uh yeah and um so rick you said you watched the uh one second i have to bring something up <clears throat> so in uh the last episode we if you, you probably listened we talked about the arrest of virgil griffith who is the head of special projects at the ethereum foundation and he was arrested uh due to being charged with allegedly violating economic sanctions by giving a talk in North Korea and also supposedly planning to transfer ether between North and South Korea and, and since then we now know that at least one of the lawyers who will be representing him is Brian Klein um interestingly enough um that's the same lawyer who's been representing uh Malware Tech uh, when he w- was uh surprise arrested by the fbi while he was at a conference in the u.s um i don't actually know whether he's gone back to the uk yet whether that's cleared up but he has i think since uh the case has gotten a lot easier and they're not um they they didn't end up prosecuting him yet so that's good um in virgil's case if this guy is working on his case Uh, And so he said, I think it was December 3rd, that, um, quote, today the judge found out that he should be, or found found that he should be released from jail pending trial. We dispute the untested allegations in the criminal complaint, and Virgil looks forward to his day in court when the full story can come out. Um, There haven't been any more updates from him since then, though he indicated on December, uh, no, so that was posted, I think, um, 
shortly. It was like within a day or so of Virgil being arrested. And then on December 3rd, he tweeted that he was in LAX, uh, didn't say what reason, but potentially, um, I assume, flying to New York, which is where the indictment was issued from, the Southern Court in New York. And unfortunately, um, since this is a very contentious, uh, likely national security related case, I think that uh, we probably won't see any court documents being published or not too many because as far as I can tell, I've looked on PACER and other legal archives and I haven't seen any more um, court documents coming out for, like there's not even a docket anywhere that I can see. So all we have right now is the indictment, and I'm not sure if that's just because n no one's gotten around to uploading the documents, or they're just not because there's um, some confidentiality thing, maybe a, a secrecy agreement or something. But uh, yeah, so we don't know about the current state of the case and any run-up that there's been so far for a trial or even where he is or anything like that. We don't, like, there's no definite confirmation anywhere that he's actually been released. It was just that the judge found that he should be. Um, another thing that came out on December 3rd was an article from Reuters where they claimed to quote someone who knew Virgil or at least was privy to conversations he allegedly had leading up to his trip to North Korea. And this person claims that, quote, Virgil Griffith, 36, uh, a U.S. citizen who works for the Ethereum Foundation, told fellow digital currency experts in April 2018 about his intention to arrange the delivery into North Korea of equipment to create Ether. Uh, one of the sources said Griffith said it would be, quote, really cool if Ether were mined in North Korea. Uh, they go further. Reuters was unable to determine whether Griffith the plans to send the equipment to North Korea, which had not been previously reported into fruition. Federal prosecutors in Manhattan charged Griffith for a different incident, accusing him of bearing valuable technical information during a conference in North Korea in April 2019. So it's entirely possible that this uh, extra allegation could already be cons being considered in the investigation, but we don't know because it wasn't in the indictment. Um, so yeah, they do note that it's unclear whether this activity is known to prosecutors. Um, it was not mentioned in the indictment, but they, um, if they decided to investigate that as part of the case, this would definitely worsen his situation because now we're talking about financial transactions, a talk that they are alleging is the transfer of, you know, specialized technical knowledge, and then the cross-border transfer of infrastructure that has already been that it's already suspected that mining equipment is being used by the North Korean military in order to fund their operations by you know mining cryptocurrency. Um, I think we've brought that up before. I don't know how it seems. It definitely seems possible. I don't know um, how like whether it's been confirmed, but if that's the suspicion. Then this it's like three different things that are not going to make them happy. Um, but another interesting article that came out, I think it was in Coindesk, is that someone from the Tor project said, um, it was like shortly after it was announced that he had been arrested, someone um, said that they had actually gone with him and that they could, uh, they could dispute some of the claims that were being made about the purpose of the trip and what happened during the trip. And obviously this guy has the conflict of interest that he's a friend of Virgil and he himself would become of interest um, to the government if that's the case in terms of investigating this and getting evidence and subpoenaing people. But he does say that, um, I mean, it's just interesting in terms of he's one of the few people that would actually know what was happening there. And he claims that the conference was actually really boring and there were people sleeping and um, yes, there was like government officials there, but he, he claims that there was actually no sanctions. Like the word sanctions wasn't mentioned at all. And that was due to the fact that they were told from the beginning, talk about politics, blah, blah, blah. 
which that that seems like I don't see anything I don't see anything wrong with uh that possibility that definitely seems possible that that happened um so I guess we're just gonna have to find out as this case pans out but at the moment we don't have that much more information than we did about a week ago yeah if they press on material transactions and trying to ship physical hardware he's fucked like that's that's it like at this point i i just want to know how wide of a precedent they try to set with this yeah this is something that kind of freaked me out and kind of like uh yeah it made me look at that, that whole like traveling around the globe talking about bitcoin thing a little differently where i was like oh yeah you know like there might be you know i mean nothing to do with that to mexico it doesn't seem but it was on the border with belize and like you know you always have to mind your p's and q's whenever you're working with Dude, sophisticated mexico. well what, what happens if there's a guy from a cartel in the audience you see yeah this is where the, exactly what i think you were talking about last episode was you know you don't know who's going to be there and you know you can have some sidebar discussion and that sidebar discussion could be with an FBI agent posing as a North Korean person, you know? I mean, like, you just have to really understand that, like, if you start talking about, hey, you're North Korea and I want to help you mine and bit mine Ethereum because I think that's cool. I mean, like, you're, yeah, you're, you're, do you're definitely taking your uh, life in your hands there. I mean, uh, it's just, that's a risk uh, as far as, uh, you know, what, the United, I mean, like, whenever the Petro was created, right? Like, uh, the only time that I've seen the possibility of a United States citizen violating a uh, U.S. sanction as as easy as just donating to the Petro address. I mean, like, you know, flying overseas and then, you know, going to a country where we've got sanctions and then, like, you know, talking about, you know, helping them create the infrastructure to mine transactions and push transactions across the Ethereum network and. You know, yeah, it seems like that was just a pretty stupid move on uh, Virgil's part. I mean, maybe just naive. I don't know. But, I mean, he's in trouble. I don't know what to say about it other than I, I think that we brought this whole subject up in the past because wasn't uh, wasn't there some Chinese mining going on in North Korea at one point where they were taking advantage of the infrastructure there and they were using uh, the electricity there and to mine? I think that was the case. But it could have also just been that, for sure, North Korea has been in the news a lot as far as trying to use uh, malware and ransomware to accumulate cryptos, currencies of various networks to try and violate sanctions. I mean, so, you know, going there and saying you're going to teach them how to set up an infrastructure and, you know, participate in all this. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, that just seemed like something I definitely would have been thinking about where I would have been like, I don't know if that's really that smart of an idea. But, you know, some of these people are real crypto anarchists and they want to get out there and create this system and they don't see the point in these borders and everything. And, you know, they don't I mean, they just want to throw the table over. And so they just, you know, maybe Virgil's in that in that camp. Uh, so, yeah, so the the two stories I remember us talking about is the one about how North Korea is suspected of being behind some ransomware attempts and that they've amassed like two billion dollars worth of i don't know if it was just bitcoin i assume it was bitcoin and a bunch of other things but bit, like cryptocurrency worth about two billion dollars something like that and then the other one was that the the military was possibly using mining equipment to uh mine cryptocurrency and then i guess sell it or something in order to fund their activities that was what i remember but yeah, the the thing about this case is that they 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 tried to focus on the talk mostly in the indictment, but it's pretty obvious that they cast a very like they call it a conspiracy because there's a number of there's a number of allegations to this case that contribute to um the charges there's the fact that he you know asked permission was supposedly denied and then and then he went at all like him going at all is already something that he could get in trouble for no no matter what he was getting up to while he was there 
Then there's the part about participating in a conference, which, you know, he's, they, people are saying he didn't contribute or he didn't, he didn't benefit financially at all from there. He, you know, paid, you know, a few thousand dollars worth of money to go there and supposedly didn't make any money. But, you know, there's this whole thing about transfer of technical knowledge, and I guess that's part of the economic sanctions. It's not just whether there was money flowing. It's Absolutely. whether, yeah. So there's like a whole, there's a whole bunch of things that like, there's like little allegations that they've made that they didn't focus on, but they could, they could get him on any of these. Like just him going alone was a problem. Participating in the conference was potentially a problem. If he conducted this, as I was saying in the the prior episode when we talked about this, um, the supposed transfer, whether he was planning to or not, if he did it, we don't know. That's a problem if he did that. And then if he had any plans to actually send mining equipment, that's, I don't know, on the scale of things, I don't know if that's the biggest problem, uh, the biggest allegation, but that seems pretty significant to me. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of things. Um, and like I said, it's pretty, it's not deniable at this point that he went because he was posting visas and everything. So everyone knows that he went. And now it's the question of like, what did he do while he was there? But at this point, he's already he's already in trouble because just going alone was a big mistake. You know, like Shinobi, you're talking about precedent, and it's like what kind of, like just the precedent of like, hey, you have knowledge of cryptocurrencies and how they could be effectively used, and you go to a country that we think uh, that is that we are currently have in sanctions, and just going to that country now, you're arrested and you're questioned. I mean, that's it. Just sort of shows just how powerful this technology really is, and that the that some of the major players in this big system that we're in they understand, and like uh, you know, just going over there. Yeah, that was uh, that was something that I guess like now just like yeah, being really knowledgeable about a subject and then visiting a country where there's sanctions there, you'll probably get pulled aside on your next flight out and asked some questions, maybe put in a prison. That's that's uh, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, and I don't I don't remember because I I've had a couple of conversations about this. I don't know if I mentioned it during the last episode, but one of the things that people have been saying is that he you know he's such a great peacemaker. He has experience like resolving disputes between Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, Are you seriously uh -huh. comparing some like little insignificant like developer squabbles to like? you know, a decades long conflict between two countries and then all the geopolitical garbage drama around that. Like that's not anywhere on the same scale as North and South Korea fighting or not fighting or what, like n that is not the same experience <laughs> level required. You need more XP for that, buddy. Um, but one of the... <laughs> Good one. Um, so I, and I also don't, I think we didn't bring it up, but I, you're not a fan of Laura Shin, but I think she made a lot of good points about the, Shinobi, come on, just let me. So she, uh, this was December 1st, um, after people had been talking about it again for another two days or so after we did, and... She said, hey guys, I see a lot of misconceptions about North Korea underlying a lot of the tweets on it, and I think it's important to understand uh, what makes this country different before you form an opinion on the virtual situation. And I'm only going to read a few, there's a lot of tweets, but the one that I stood out to me was where she said, I see people saying it's not a crime to help the North Korean people, but the only way to help North Korean people is in secret. Any public activity between North Korea and a foreigner is with the dictatorship, not with everyday people. Um, so yeah, there's a few other things, and I just... Like, again, in case anyone's confused, like, I don't, I don't agree with any, I, I don't agree with, like, many aspects of the U.S. State Department's foreign policy or the Justice Department or lots of aspects of the U.S. government because I don't really, <laughs> I don't really uh, philosophically uh, or politically agree with these kinds of state structures, if you know what I mean, but I also 
you know, what I'm looking at, what people choose to focus their attention on and focus their energy towards and things like that. I, I still, I can still think that people are incredibly stupid for misallocating their, their funds, their resources, their attention, uh, and taking unnecessary risks when they didn't have to for very little benefit. Like there's, (laughs) <laughs> just, just like this is it if these allegations are true he did a bunch of legal stuff that doesn't mean that i agree with the prison system or anything i think that's a, that's where a lot of people are on this but we can also think you know this was a really stupid mistake to make and it was an unnecessary risk and it shouldn't have happened um at the same time still don't agree that economic sanctions actually work or any kind of sanctions actually work at the end of the day Uh, But that also, you know, just because you're, you know, you're willing to break sanctions because you don't believe in them. On the other hand, you know, if you're going to break sanctions, could you at least do it in a way that it's like not obvious that you're probably not helping any people who are actually in danger or need help uh, or living under dictatorships? That would be a good idea. Yep. Yeah, it seems like it would have been a lot cooler if he went to Hong Kong. Yeah. Do that one, guy. I think you would have had the political uh, favor. Yeah, I mean, I it, he would have been so much safer if he had gone to Hong Kong and been like, hey, you know that people in China before have tried to get around censorship by publishing stuff on the Ethereum blockchain. Now, whether whether your stuff will remain censorship censorship resistant is another question but why don't you start publishing on ethereum it's like that would have been a hundred times more commendable than this absolutely and yeah it just would have definitely also been like uh i don't know i think that would have probably been the riskier move because there's just like it's possibility of getting captured by the chinese government Mm -hmm. and speaking of putting things on the ethereum blockchain uh to to bypass chinese censorship uh apparently sometime in september the great firewall started blocking etherscan.io the biggest uh ethereum blockchain explorer uh and it's this is just kind of weird for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, one is that this is the only Ethereum Explorer that's been blocked. Uh, two is the ridiculous amount of time that's actually passed since you know people started posting censored information on the Ethereum chain so people could access it. And also the fact that there is literally a different domain mirroring this inside China that's still accessible. So it's like, it's, it's, it's really kind of weird, not effective, not even like kind of common sense in the first iteration and the the amount of stuff they try to handle with it it's just really weird like i don't see even the stupidest most illiterate or like technically illiterate member of the the communist party thinking that just blocking this one single domain to a single blockchain explorer for ethereum would solve anything so it's like what 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 are you what are they doing yeah, honestly, I didn't know. Like, whenever I saw that they were uh, that they were doing this, I was like, "Well, isn't that the like that's the primary source block explorer that most people use is EtherScan on that network?" I mean, like, as far as I've always heard, whenever somebody's like, "Grab a block explorer in Ethereum, grab an Ethereum block explorer," it's always EtherScan. So, I mean, like, it must be the absolute predominant one. And like, as far as signaling goes, though, it was kind of like, well, I mean, the first thing I thought about was like, well, you know. Ether is kind of competing, competing with Bitcoin Cash and whatever the hell China's creating as far as their uh, digital asset that the People's Bank of China and, and the Chinese gov- government's working on. So, I mean, maybe they're just sort of like they know 
well, we've banned the hell out of Bitcoin as much as we can, but we can't ban it to this point, and we've kind of figured out that this is the level of censorship we can have on that network, so now let's start testing these other ones, and maybe they're about to put Ethereum through the ringer. Yeah, but like, why so slow? I mean, there's other explorers out there. There's the the mirror portal to the same one <laughs> that still works. It's like they they took almost no serious effort to do the most basic shit to actually make it hard to find an Ethereum blockchain explorer. Yeah, and I mean, there's always the you know standard practice over there. Just use a VPN, and you're back on EtherScan, no problem. So, I mean, yeah, I really don't see the point in it either but i mean like it does kind of i don't know we're talking about this guy uh you know griffith and like talking about mining ether in north korea and ethereum and china and china's asset that they're creating and i just know that yeah, there's a lot of political strife over there as far as just yeah north korea hong kong china you know taiwan south china sea all that stuff is kind of and strife and so yeah, I uh, I don't know. Maybe they see it as just like, hey, somebody was going to try and help North Korea mine Ethereum, and uh, you know, maybe we don't like that, or we do, or you know, we want to start prodding the infrastructure to maybe see if we can help develop it because they know that banning Bitcoin helped develop its censorship resistance features. So maybe they're trying to do that. I mean, you know, I'm not really sure. It is kind of a weird move. I mean, Janine, you got any input? Like. Uh yeah, I mean it doesn't it doesn't surprise me at all. It's ever ever I've been occasionally like chronicling uh when I was looking at uh what's the project called Civil when I was looking at Civil um when they started using Infura that's when I was really looking into like okay what is most of Ethereum infrastructure running on and. That's what a lot of people are saying now is that, you know, they're they're blocking Etherscan, but it's more likely they would be effective if they just tried to block stuff from Infura because so much of the Ethereum network is running on those those nodes that you you'd be a lot more effective just blocking, you know, the actual node infrastructure and it would be would not be hard at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, if you want to test, I mean, maybe that's just like they know that. They'd be like, well, we're not trying to kill it. You know, they know they can kill it. I mean, you shut down Infura, I think that would be a big problem. Or maybe we're all just giving people in the Chinese government way too much credit and they just really are this stupid. Ah, I don't know, man. It seems like everybody's got their, uh, their war face on right now. Yeah. All right, well, um, next up, I kind of wanted to just touch on a article published on Bitcoin Magazine uh, by Jesse Wilms again on the mining ecosystem and kind of just, again, pull out a little nugget from a very expansive story that just treats something that should be a lot more focal in it uh, as just a little detail. But uh, so this article is pretty much just on the, the massive rush wave of, of miners interest and expansion in North America, uh, given the kind of weird uncertainty as far as regulations and legality goes um, operating in China. And she kind of starts off talking about the impressions of Ryan Porter from a company BitUdu, which advises mining companies and investors on investment strategies and risk management. And he's been seeing a massive uptick in interest of uh, mining operations wanting to expand or start in North America, especially a, a lot of Chinese operations looking at mining. And so I kind of want to like look at this and just see how much and how quickly shit is maturing that there is literally a financial services company in New York that's specifically advising crypto investors and mining companies on how to most effectively deploy their capital and manage their risk. So hedge their operations, where they choose to, to set things up 
and kind of point back to the, the last time I looked at one of Jesse's articles, the fact that she just briefly mentioned that Bitmain now has a new business arm specifically dealing with helping miners think through logistical operations and moving operations or expanding and running them. And just think about how massive the more the mining ecosystem matures, this type of service can get to be and how important it will be in the overall mining ecosystem. And remember that Bitmain is trying to slide into this role very slowly under the radar from everywhere I've seen. And then the, the second thing I want to kind of go into just really quick is all the different companies operating in North America right now. So there is uh, Salcedo Enterprises uh, in Washington. They have three data centers. Uh, Bitmain is in Washington State as well uh, with some facilities there. Uh, in New York State, there is Coinmint running three uh, mining facilities as well. Texas, uh, another Bitmain facility. Layer One, the San Francisco company Peter Thiel invested in. Then uh, Windstone in Northern, um, an, another company with a 100-acre mining farm. In California, there's uh, Pluton Mining. Uh, Georgia, Blockstream, uh, one of their facilities is there. Nebraska, Compute North. Um, and they're specifically a co-location um, service, so a lot of their stuff is hosting other people's equipment. In Alberta, Canada, there's Hut 8, uh, Upstream Data, then Quebec, again, a Blockstream facility, uh, Bit Farms with five facilities in Quebec, uh, in British Columbia, uh, DMG. Uh, they also, I believe, are the company working on the uh, mobile deployable containers. And um, yeah, just those are all actual large scale companies either running their own mining operations or facilities for individual miners to have their equipment hosted. So like we are really maturing in terms of the mining ecosystem moving to a more formally structured like corporate business operation level. It's not just amateurs anymore. And the, the, you know, a lot of the amateurs or the, the smaller scale individuals are starting to move to host in, in places like these facilities. So like we are rapidly moving to the point where those types of hedging and risk management services are going to be massive in the mining ecosystem and critical. And Bitmain is just slyly slipping in under the radar. And if they're actually able to become a big player in that space, I mean, that is another way for them to draw in capital, keep their business operating, and not wind up going bankrupt. Yeah, I mean, like, it definitely looks like mining in uh, the United States is kind of setting up shop. I mean, like you had mentioned, and I'd seen the uh, Blockstream facility, like, we reported on that whenever it's talked about as far as that one in Georgia. And... uh you know, I mean, yeah, I've heard a lot of rumblings about uh, Bitmain and, you know, we've seen we've covered some stuff going on in Texas. I think what they recently got a 300 megawatt facility in Texas. And yeah, I mean, it just seems like there's definitely moves with big producers of energy in the area that are getting together with big mining companies to uh, or just creating new companies to start these uh, mining operations to take advantage of this energy. I think people are starting to wake up to what's going on with the mining world. I mean, the idea of all this uh, energy that's being wasted, I think everybody that's in the ener energy industry understands uh, the importance of Bitcoin mining and like the way that you can, um, you know, capture that and actually... Uh, make a lot of money with it. And so uh, people are making moves to do that all across the country. And it's not just in, you know, Texas and Georgia, like you're saying, it's all these different locations, but it's also these, uh, you know, little remote sites and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's headed in that direction. It's moving forward. I mean, you know, this is where, I mean, what the hash rate is, uh, I don't even know. I haven't looked at it in a while, but I know that it's always moving up. So uh, maybe I should pull that up, but I know it's up going up. Well, last I checked, it was 100 exahash. But I mean, you know, it's not just trapped power. 
Like how how long Damn. is it until people start building new power production just because they know miners will buy up to at least uh this price because that's profitable? Well, yeah, that's where I really want to see that. I want to start seeing like uh, you know, a lot of like renewable energy things get developed where they're like, hey, you know, we got this incentive, we can build this, the miners are gonna come here, they're gonna mine, like, let's do it. But you know, there's a long way to go for that. I mean, to where there's just a lot of uncaptured energy out there right now as far as, like, the resources we have. I'm sure that, you know, it might cause another natural gas boom in uh, different areas of the country. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, in Louisiana, there was, like, a big natural gas boom where all of a sudden there's all these companies showing up to, you know, survey, clear, drill, uh, you know, clean the engineering parts of it and uh you know in louisiana you, you, there was a lot of uh, not much industry to begin with but when it, once it all left like this was sort of the first comers coming back in and all that sort of got shut down whenever opec got together to kind of uh keep the prices down and so if something else can just kind of jump in and sort of take the position to like get that uh get that shell profitable again i'm i'm sure uh you know the people of that area of louisiana would probably be well, I don't know. That's where it, it kind of gets into the discussion. Like, you know, what about the clean energy, dirty energy and all that? But either way, you know, it's just the growing, evolving aspect of Bitcoin mining in the United States. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. So now that I'm done explaining how Bitmain is hiding in every shadow, uh, you want to tell us what's going on in, uh, in regulator land, Janine? Regulators. <gasps> yeah, so I don't know much extra information about this story, um, but it apparent it appears that the SEC, uh, as you can see in the headline from CoinDesk, they've appointed a new head of their cyber division. Uh, so it's apparently being um, previously the head of the cyber division was Robert. Cohen and uh, it's now being taken over by a guy. Where did they put his name? Christy. Where's his first name? Damn it. I thought Christine. It... Oh, Christina. Christina Littman. There it is. It's a whammy. They're call. Yeah, they were calling her Christy. I was like, oh god, like Chris Christy. No. So Christina Littman is going to be the new chief of the uh, enforcement uh, division of enforcement cyber unit, uh, according to Clayton, which I think isn't. Was Clayton the uh, crypto daddy? Yeah, or am the I... SEC. Yeah. Chairman. Oh God. <laughs> so crypto no. daddy, crypto daddy says uh, Christie's innovative thinking and extensive expertise or experience within the commission um, have made her an invaluable advisor and most importantly, a tireless defender of America's interests. She will be an excellent leader of the cyber unit as it continues its work in this critical and evolving era. Um, so yeah, I've not done background research on her. Maybe there's uh, something interesting to see there, but apparently sh the history that we know of, at least from this announcement is that um She's going to be taking over the kick uh, lawsuit, uh, which we have talked about before. The that was the funny one where um, no, well, there was a related thing about CoinDesk uh, messing up the kick CEO. I think it was the kick CEO, right? They um, yeah. they thought they were yeah they thought they were getting messages from the kick CEO, and it turns out they were just messaging a random Telegram account or something. It's like, yeah, so they didn't mention that here. They probably should have just, you know, to make extra sure that they've made up for that mistake. But so she's taking over the kick lawsuit and also the uh, investigation into Telegram uh, and whether it's token as a security. So interesting. Yeah, chief crypto cop. I like that uh, that title, but. Yeah, I was looking at to it like you guys said James Clayton was the crypto daddy. That is actually the uh former CFTC chair, um Chris Giannarclo or whatever his last name was. But yeah, that was Oh, the guy. it was Giancarlo. Giancarlo. 
Okay, yeah. So he was the one that was the crypto daddy. James Clayton is just the guy that has been uh, delaying the ETFs mad, like left and right. <laughs> oh, so we're supposed to hate him, I assume. I don't really care well, about ETFs, but... We hate him because he's a top government regulator, not more the ETF thing, right? <laughs> we just hate him because he's in government. Make the no. bad government man go away. We're just joking around, James. We like you, man. We like you. And uh, we wish that the SEC would, um, you know, just uh, do what's right and just uh, leave Bitcoin the F alone, right? That's not going to happen. But Don't leave Ethereum alone. Never leave them alone. They don't, don't like being alone. I mean, like, all, all I really see going on here is some head shuffling so that one guy can go advise who they've been prosecuting and then the more experienced uh air quote innovative as they put it uh and probably younger person can take over in getting as many icos and and things to fuck with as possible fucked with it seems like standard operating procedure for regulators right yeah you poke and prod and see what you can get and that's it all right I'm going to move this forward because, uh, you know, who cares about the SEC and their cyber division, right? Let's talk about who owns Poloniex and why they're big on Tron. Like, uh, there was a, co a report a couple of months back where uh, the block on October 18th put out an article where they were talking about how Poloniex was uh, being purchased by a consortium that was headed by Justin Sun of Tron. And then uh, just recently, you know, their uh, market share finally went back up to 2%. It had fallen really low ever since uh, Circle had bought Poloniex back in 2017. And so it's just been like kind of a dwindling exchange, not really doing anything because of uh, U.S. regulations and that compliance issues that they were having. So they decided to stop serving U.S. customers and they started selling out to this consortium. Uh, with the help of a $100 million investment. And so, you know, Poloniex has been tweeting out a lot of favorable stuff about uh, Tron and that network, and Justin Sun's been tweeting out a lot of great stuff about Poloniex, and it's just been a relationship made in heaven. And apparently, you know, Jared Tate, the head guy of uh, Digibyte, he was getting a lot of Tron trolls bugging him about how Tron was getting big at Poloniex and all this stuff because... Poloniex did release this. Uh, I had the all these different uh, links pulled up, but I lost them for some reason. So, yeah, Poloniex did announce like they were creating some index made of Tron assets, and that they were happy to list Tron assets for free. And so, I guess like this was just a bunch of discussion headed towards Jarrett Tate about how Tron's better than Digibyte and all this. And so he posted up a thread. And just got a little rage about it. And, uh, you know, it's just eight tweets about uh, how this was ridiculous and how Poloniex is, uh, you know, just being controlled by Tron. And um, then Poloniex says, after careful consideration, they are, uh, where is it? After careful review, we decided Digibyte is not qualified per our listing standard. We will delist Digibyte soon. Details to be announced. So, you know. Drama in uh, shitcoin, shitcoin exchange land, and uh, Justin Sun and Poloniex trying to, uh, you know, push back a little bit on all of the bad press they're getting for this. And uh, they're saying they're watching Bitfinex's Lightning Network developments closely, and, you know, they're going to try and move forward with these technological developments. But, you know, that's just them trying to put out lip service to try and you know, everybody on Bitcoin Twitter is a little, you know, I mean, it's just very obvious that this is like the level of degradation that the crypto scene has gotten to, to the point to where you have a big network like Tron and, uh, you know, their illustrious leader, Justin Sun, working with a consortium to buy the shitcoin exchange to start listing their assets and everybody's pointed out. And yeah, it's uh, it's just a hysterical situation that i think we should have, we should have to cover but as far as it goes right now it's really just uh yeah like i'm saying justin sun and poloniex are trying to sort of just 
push the PR and say like, we're watching lightning and the lightning developments really closely and we want to help move Poloniex in that direction. But the reality is, is like, uh, man, this might be one of the most centrally controlled uh, shitcoin exchanges now. I don't know. These shitcoin exchanges like, uh, you know, Bitrex, I haven't talked about those guys in a while, but I'm sure they've got their little favored networks. But yeah, so uh, also just got this email from uh, Poloniex where it says, let's see, what was it on December, t- December 16th? So that's 10 days from now or maybe just like a week since this will be released. Any assets that you have, if you're a U.S. customer and you have assets still sitting in Poloniex, which like myself, I think I've got like 100 Doge sitting on Poloniex that I just left there because I didn't want to KYC myself. And so now that 100 Doge is going to be transferred into USDC on uh, December 16th. And uh, yeah, I guess it'll sit in their stable coin from this point going forward. So that's what's going on in the world of shitcoinery and shitcoin exchanges. What do you guys think about all this? Uh, yes, careful review three hours after you shit talked our business partner on Twitter. Boom. Um, yeah, and I'm pretty sure that would be illegal to just take your shit and sell it for USDC and hold that in California. They have very specific laws about unclaimed or lost property, and Coinbase is actually in the middle of a class action lawsuit over that right now. Well, they might want to rethink that one then. But, I mean, maybe they're moving out. I mean, aren't they? They're incorporated in New York, though, right? I think. Yeah, but I guarantee you that law still has jurisdiction if it's a Californian um, citizen who's a customer. Yeah, I think they're pretty much counting on the fact that they're customers like myself who just had like 100 Doge there that didn't want to KYC themselves and now is just saying like, well, I'm certainly not going to go over there. And just like, you know, it's I don't know. It's just like their last ditch like, hey, here's your chance. Get your all your shit coins off our exchange and then – uh or it's turning to our stable coin. And I guess they're going to just like, you know, deal with the legal consequences if there are any. Mm -hmm. They want that volume, dude. They want that volume. Yep. So are we ready to have some real fun talking about some real serious Ethereum and other shit coin problems? Are we ready, guys? Oh, man. I think so. Is this the topic everybody's talking about? Mm, Maybe. I don't know what shit coiners talk about. But, yeah. Um, Yeah, it's this. It's the DeFi, people. Yeah, so... um, (laughs) This is why convoluted incentive structures are not safe things to pull out of your ass. So, pretty much, um, proof of stake is impossible to secure with DeFi or decentralized lending that happens on chain. It's fundamentally broken. And why is really pretty simple. And I'm amazed that this was not immediately recognized as soon as all of this shit started over there so you need uh let, let's use two-thirds as the number i think is the the normal uh ratio but you need two-thirds of stakers in proof of stake theoretically to be honest uh for it to be safe so with a little more than one-third of the staking supply um you can fuck with shit uh you push that more to an extreme, you can dominate it like a, the equivalent of a 51% attack. Okay, so let's think about this. Staking is getting a return on your money. If you are a rational staker and there's an alternative to park your money that gives a greater return, um, it makes sense to go do that instead. So DeFi existing completely changes the dynamic of staking attacks because instead of, excuse me, having to acquire the necessary funds to attack through staking out in the open market, you can simply manipulate DeFi uh, to incentivize the other honest stakers to stop staking. 
Um, and pretty much when the, the gist of it is if you take supply off by borrowing money on DeFi, um, you drive interest rates up. And so by collateralizing and borrowing in a DeFi app, you can massively inflate the interest rates for that and incentivize honest stakers to move all of their Ethereum into that instead, and then open up the entire network for you as the malicious staker um, to attack it. And there, there was actually some uh, simulations done on this, um, agent um, based simulations. If you want to go look up how that works, it's you pretty much program some behaviors and risk profiles and then do many, many runs uh, with different starting parameters um, to kind of see where things get. And with a deflationary uh, monetary supply or even a predictable um, like rate, um, every staker moved all their money into DeFi um over the the long time horizon in the simulations so it's it's completely impossible to have secure proof of stake if you have these kinds of DeFi lending things on chain point blank incentive wise it's completely impossible and the the attempted air quote solution um that's put forward at the end of this by the, the delusional ethereum heads to try to be like it's still okay is that if there is dynamic inflation that can be adjusted in response to DeFi rates by some group um, to keep stakers incentivized to stake, um, then it's all okay and we're good with that because we haven't uh, like committed to a monetary policy yet so we could do that. And they completely miss the point that that just takes this whole attack and makes it one that also um, can pretty much just hyperinflate the entire currency supply instead of winding up successfully being a dominant, unchallenged, malicious staker. So yeah, if DeFi is possible, proof of stake is impossible too. Or no, wait, no, if DeFi is possible, proof of stake is impossible. Okay, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> There's just too much stake in all these sentences. <laughs> so, so just to repeat again, their proposed solution to this is to tie their inflation schedule to the rates on a trading platform. Not a lending platform, but yeah. Lending. Yeah. Yep. Um, have that's... some people who can tweak it in response to that, like some other financial systems in the world we know of. Hmm. I mean, that's that. Yeah, that's that's so ridiculous. These people don't understand anything. Oh my goodness! This word DeFi. I mean, like, okay. First off, the staking, killing the proof of stake thing is absolutely a funny just verbiage that's funny stakes staking is killing proof of stake but uh also it's like the DeFi thing man this is becoming like such a i mean like i don't understand it it's one of those things where here in colorado i've got a lot of uh acquaintances and some few friends that are into this whole DeFi thing and they're just like you know fascinated with it and i keep figuring out like trying to figure out you know, what it is that they're fascinated about. And I mean, it is just, it seems like the same old dog and pony show we see with traditional banking. I mean, except for the fact that it is in this, you know, pe some people like this crypto anarchy aspect of things to where there is no real governance structures and it's just sort of all built into these consensus. But we know like, you know, Ethereum's consensus model requires things like we talked about in this episode. And if you're a, it requires things that are already sort of just like these central control points. And yeah, it's, uh, I'm just trying to think I got totally lost as to what the hell we were even talking about here. DeFi. Yeah. So DeFi, that word, I just feel kind of bad for anybody using that word. Cause it's just like, it's bastardized now. Like, I don't know. I'm thinking about Peter McCormick's defiance podcast. And I'm like, man, that's a cool podcast, but it's got the word DeFi in it. That makes it so uncool. Ugh. Sorry, dude. Yeah, but this is... Yeah. It's going to be funny to watch all of this come tumbling down in the end. I don't know how funny it'll be, but it'll definitely be something that's going to happen.
Mm -hmm. All right, so Janine, what is going on in cyberspace? Uh, well, so the thing I noticed today is that there's a um, virtual lightning conference that's going to be happening. I didn't check the schedule yet, but um, as far as I know, the the all of the speakers are scheduled. And so if you go to Boltathon, I think that's what their handle is also on Twitter, um, you should find the page that shows you um, the schedule for that. But the reason it's cool is because it's a virtual conference, and I think we've mentioned before that we've been interested in doing something like that because um, after going to a few conferences over the years, the biggest problem for me is like I don't have unlimited resources. I can't I can't afford to not only plan um, basically multi-day vacations in advance uh often in countries where i'm not usually planning to be but also pay for conference tickets and all the other things that comes along with going to conferences i i basically now i only go to conferences um that are in the local area where I, it's not as much of an effort to go to them because i'm already nearby but I think that virtual conferences will definitely become more popular in the next couple of years, especially because one of the, um, obviously when you're doing any kind of e-commerce stuff and registering people for events, you have to deal with, you know, accepting money. And because we're, we, there's been a lot of testing with lightning, this conference is accepting uh, lightning, obviously, uh, lightning payments to pay for your tickets. And because it's all online, there's no travel to arrange. There's no uh, venue cost. There's just the cost of setting up the platform where you can, you know, schedule speakers and make sure that you're streaming to them or voice, you know, voice or video, or whatever. Um, uh, and because, you know, storage and streaming costs are so much lower these days, it's it's like it's kind of obvious that organizers should have been drifting more in this direction because um, there's so many events I've seen where like the number one cost is the venue and some of them are over the top and it results in basically not being able to put enough resources into things like uh, choosing, you know, being more selective about speakers or the amount of content that you can offer during the event and things like that. Whereas if it's entirely virtual, you not only have a much broader potential audience because, you know, you're not having to worry about people having to cross borders and getting visas and arranging travel, if they can do that at all. Um, a lot of people can't afford it, but it's also easier for the speakers as well, like especially me because I don't want to show my face on stage and I have to plan in advance a lot to make sure that I have, uh, you know, a line of communication with the organizer so that I'm not being filmed and I have to get disguise up. Whereas if it's a virtual conference, I don't have to worry about any of that. So I definitely see that virtual conferences are going to be a bigger thing soon. And I hope they become a bigger thing because I think it, there's like so many benefits to doing virtual conferences and the fact that we have, you know, payments infrastructure now that makes it super easy. Uh, that should also drive the cost of participation down and we can actually have a lot more of a global reach with these kinds of events. Hell yeah, dude. This is like, you just gave me like, a, I'm like think, listening to you talk and I'm like, we need to do this in Boulder. Like, I, that's what I'm thinking. I'm just thinking, like, I need to rent, like, a uh, office, like, a floor of an office building somewhere downtown and just, like, reach out to my friends, like, you guys, and, like, you know, maybe bring on, we, we could bring some, uh, some, some, some of the guys back, like, uh, maybe get a conference discussion with Blake or with Theo or, you know, just, like, but, but I mean, like, what's interesting is, like, I could bring Nopar on. It's like Nopar could actually be talking to an audience in the United States, even though, you know, it's like yourself, too. It's like and you would just be at the comfort of your home, wherever the hell in the world you are, you know. And that's like uh, that's a really interesting aspect where it's like, um, 
you know, I could have like maybe just a weekend of speakers lined up all through these, you know, just like like a Skype call, but not Skype, something that's a little more open source and something that, you know, people would agree to. I mean, you know, work out the technicals, but that is something that I should definitely be thinking about lining up. I'm going to I'm I'm glad. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be thinking about that. This is interesting. Mm-hmm. Definitely a good model, I think, going forward. But I think now that we've talked about something positive uh, with lightning, I need to I need to talk some shit about it. Mm. What? You know, there, there, there's a topic uh, that allows that. Oh no! What? When did we talk positive about it? I mean, yeah, I thought this was a positive story. Nope. So, uh, Bitfinex has launched Lightning Network support. Um, Woo! yeah, and so I want to talk a little bit about um why that's really stupid in most cases. Wah, wah, wah. So, where this does make sense, as I've said many, many times, is if you spend regularly with the Lightning Network and you just want to top off a channel that you've depleted and just continue reusing it. Now, you know, it makes perfect sense. You can just buy a little bit of Bitcoin, withdraw that to that channel over the Lightning Network, and just keep reusing the same channel without having to close it. Perfectly rational logical thing for exchanges to start doing but two things that this is really stupid for is trading um i have gone into the whole trading dynamics so much um i'm not doing it here the liquidity doesn't work go read me reading on twitter but from just the time process you are submitting yourself to a whole bunch of liquidity constraints on the Lightning Network that don't work with trading, like actual trading. And on top of that, according to their support page, it takes two to three minutes for a Lightning deposit to the exchange to be recognized by their back end and credited to your account. So there's literally, as far as time, like depositing money over Lightning, to, to be able to trade quickly, there's no advantage whatsoever over liquid here. And you actually suffer a lot of extra limitations because of the, the liquidity uh, constraints of the Lightning Network versus liquid. So that's just absurd um, as far as a, a reason for exchanges to implement it. Although I, I want to repeat again, like doing this to top off a spending wallet you have on Lightning is perfectly reasonable. But another thing, the final thing I think is really fucking stupid is I've seen a lot of talk on Twitter about how you can use your Bitfinex account to pay for things um, like gift cards from BitRefill. And that is absolutely fucking retarded because it's Finex's lightning node that's paying that invoice. You take that invoice and you put it into Finex's site so their node can pay it. All the information in there they get, they know who you're, you're, you're paying. If they put any invoice details such as, you know, like what you're buying or your order, that's in there and Finex is getting it. Like from a privacy point of view, it is absolutely retarded. Like they get to see all the little details bundled up in every invoice that you paste into their thing. So like, yeah. Uh, everybody's clapping themselves on the back and jerking off. Oh, Bitfinex has lightning integration. Yay. But they're ignoring that only one of the three real possible things to do with this makes sense. One is just incredibly inefficient and idiotic and has no advantages over other alternatives being built out. And the last one using this for retail shit is just outright idiotic from a privacy point of view. You are giving Bitfinex all of the details that are in the Lightning invoice you paste so that they can pay. Like, that is idiotic. Well, I get your, you know, your frustration with it. I still think that it's got its use case. I still think that there's customers out there that are going to want to use it. There's Bitfinex customers that are not necessarily 100% in the privacy game, and they're probably... You know, 
they realize like, hey, I'm I'm trading with Bitfinex for a long time, and you know maybe they do have enough identifiers to where they're not worried about using BitRefill and these turbo channels to purchase goods and services that they might need. That you know, as far as being able to purchase something without having to go to USD, and like that route. I think does have a place like whether like for sure it's like a uh, you know if you're looking at spending like that and you do consider your privacy like to be something that you value a lot then you know you might want to rethink that process and wait for something that's a little bit more private in its ability to spend like that. But that's but, the, uh, the point, though, Rick, is like we're doing so good pretty much in terms of mobile lightning while it's like just fucking get a channel open from somewhere and top that off. Well, you know, I mean, like maybe that's step two, and this is the this is the first exchange to implement this, and uh, you know, this is where it's like the way that I see it, it's a good thing. I mean, it's just it's it's furthering the Lightning Network development. Whether or not it's the best answer for you know particular use cases, I doubt it. But I mean, it it is an answer for some use cases, and it's something that could push the development further to where maybe there are these hops in between, and something that just adds to that layer of privacy. And uh, but just, you know, get the ball moving first and then sort of, you know, correct course where you can. And uh, that's where, you know, I'm, I'm going to give them uh, compliments over there at BitPenix for implementing this. And uh, good job at BitRefill for, uh, you know, doing something to where people are using the Lightning Network to uh, purchase things. That's uh, that's I know it's not exactly the best thing for privacy, but that's something where people are using it, using Bitcoin. And I think that's uh, that's cool and pushes development forward. I think that's I'm, absolutely horrible. Like, if if you're gonna, if the argument is push the technology forward at the cost of privacy, that's horrible. Well, I mean, I'm, look, you go ahead, Janine. You need to get in on this. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm ambivalent about it because it's like it's something that I like. I don't know. It feels like something that I knew was going to happen eventually. Exchanges were going to add lightning options and support and stuff so it's like it's not exciting to me because it was kind of predictable and it's also like it's just i don't know i mean whatever you want to deposit into an exchange and you don't want to have to first go into liquid and then blah blah, blah. uh you get the benefit of a few more minutes maybe i don't know how long deposits take normally with just regular Bitcoin payments to show up in Bitfinex, but I assume it's like a few minutes, maybe a few hours difference. Um, that's that's nice, uh, I guess, but it's like you're. I just everyone should be aware, you know, just because you're using Lightning, you're also using it with a custodial exchange that's running analytics software, and they're slurping up all of this data and like. Shinobi said, if you're doing it with invoices and stuff, and that has metadata in it, uh, and you're giving that to them, you're not getting any of the benefits of at using Lightning from a privacy perspective. So all you're really getting is this meme of like faster, cheaper payments. Um, that's that's the only possible benefit. Um, but then again, it's just like I don't I don't really care. It's like another way to deposit. Or I don't know if they allow withdrawals to Lightning as well. I didn't check, but it's like, okay, another way to enter and possibly exit an exchange. That's interesting, but it's not something I'm going to use because I don't use these exchanges. So it doesn't it's not interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, it's different, you know, markets for these things. And I mean, like, uh, just the way I see it is like, I can't be a Bitfinex customer because like, I have to be doxxed to be in this system. And, uh, I mean, somebody, they can, uh, yeah, I mean, they could create something like this that I could use, but I don't know. It's just as far as I'm looking at it as from a standpoint of that there's some people that, you know, their privacy is already leaked. And, like, I'm also thinking about just, like, there's room for improvement there. Like, I mean, on the Lightning Network, I mean, just tracing a transaction from, the Lightning Network through the different hops and the routes. I mean, that's not exactly an easy process. And then, like, you're trying to track, like, where the transaction took place. Like, you're going to need a yeah, surveillance the, camera the, the on the point endpoint of that Finex, transaction, though, right? Is like, Finex gets everything. 
they know all your balances and you have to give them the invoice to pay it so they know who you're paying so they know exactly what you're buying and where where you're shopping okay i guess like yeah you know but this is where it's like i understand man it's like trying to escape just the mad stretch of digital surveillance it's really hard i mean um you know this is where I think like just implementing it and, you know, working to find out where are the tracking points is where that system will improve. And I mean, uh, you know, that's where it's like just to get the ball rolling on that. It sounds like a good thing to uh, help improve Lightning Network uh, liquidity, fungibility, privacy, all these things that might come up. It's a it are, you know, will come up. It's like a, uh, a thing that can help improve that system. Just like whenever China bans Bitcoin and then the censorship resistant features of Bitcoin, you know, that sort of moves to the forefront of development. Eh, I think this is idiotic. And I think this whole direction of using lightning is going to cause a bunch of problems and lead to a bunch of people eating crow. Well, this is why I like the fact that we have two major scaling solutions and they are in competition and uh, we just keep moving both of them forward and they'll find their niche markets. The bigger question is what drives a person to mow dead grass in the winter? Yes. Right. Is there a, yeah, you were yes. saying in the chat, somebody's mowing your grass in the, well, I guess the beginning of winter near about. Some grass is being mowed out the or outside the building somewhere and I hear it and if it gets close enough that I can hear it loudly, I'm going to get really fucking angry. But in the spirit of moving along and not doing that, um, just a quick update. Uh, four days ago, the person who posted the infamous I lost four Bitcoin on Lightning Network um, that could not be found anywhere on chain for thousands of blocks after Lightning developers scanned through looking for penalty transactions, um, posted on reddit and said that he um, pretty much recovered most of his coins uh, with the help of a lot of lnd community members and um that he fucked up so uh yeah uh nothing actually closed it was just a bunch of node uh failures and he's gone through and manually closed most of the channels and um that's what happened there so this is why you don't put four bitcoins on beta technology Right? That's like super reckless. Come on, guy. Wait, Fuck. he put four Bitcoin? <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, God. Jesus. Like, where are you going to spend the point? He must have really wanted to tear up Satoshi's place or, you know, something. Funds are safe. Not quite <laughs> to the point of making that much money yet. All right. Well, I'm glad he got some of his money back. Mm-hmm. All righty. So next up, um, something I missed, which I'm very angry at myself for, but six days ago, uh, join market 0.6.0 was released, uh, with a decent amount of changes. Um, so there have been, um, some bug fixes around, uh, max fee enforcements for join market QT that only affected the, the GUI client. Um, there has been some tweaks in the um, the Tumblr algorithm that, that keeps tumbling coins over and over again to try and improve privacy there. Um, kind of adding more participants, mixing a little less frequently, and changing how they handle mix steps. Um, there, there's actually a link in the release notes if you want to go through and kind of read about just the, the changes to the Tumblr algorithm. Um, there were some refactoring changes to the wallet um, so that uh, depositing money from outside no longer requires manually restarting um, to rescan balances. Uh, the wallet should simply just recognize things in the background. And as well, um, there is now support for um, some custom scripts for yield generating. So being a maker and providing liquidity to uh, the mixes. Um, if you really want to get that deep and dirty with it, you can kind of dig around and play with uh, one alternative custom uh, set up for that that's recommended in the release notes. But all around, I want to 
you know, say thanks to Balcher, uh, Waxwing, and everybody else who contributed to this release. And uh, I hope to see many more awesome improvements uh, to join market in the near future. Heck yeah, let's improve all the fungibility options. I'm down with that. Also, let's stop some uh, some stupid fucking bickering. Yeah, I think that's yeah, it's it's coming down to a to a qual. Yeah. Uh, so all right, yes. why don't you tell us the big news? Yeah. So um, Jack Dorsey recently took a trip to Africa and attended a uh, Bitcoin meetup uh, while in Nigeria uh, during his travels through a few different countries, Ethiopia, Ghana, Nigeria, and South Africa. And um, he plans on moving back for around six months or so to Africa. Um, He didn't specify which country and living there for six months in 2020. And it's specifically since this this recent trip and talking about the, the massive potential of Bitcoin in Africa and, and pretty much saying this is going to be ground zero for where Bitcoin takes off. And I mean, I can't really see somebody like Jack kind of taking this much attention and going to spend this much more time there for half a year without some serious kind of plan behind that and how to make this this prediction or or meme he's spreading actually a reality and so you know i think square and cash app and and just you know square crypto especially um are things we should all really keep an eye on and what they start moving towards because you know that you you don't just do something like this from a PR point of view without follow through with it, and so I'm really interested to see like what the hell Jack is thinking in terms of really expanding the the access and and the tools needed to to really make that happen, like make Bitcoin or I mean make Africa ground zero for Bitcoin taking off. Well, it's one of those places where it was like originally banking the unbanked, right? And, you know, getting these people that just don't have access to banking services, banking services. And whenever it comes to it, like, yeah, Africa has got the, you know, a very large population of unbanked people and, um, you know, no banking services. So maybe they're going to do the uh, hop skip thing that happens with some technology in some countries where, you know, they kind of skip one step of tech to move right next to the, to what the iteration that people are working with now, which uh, as far as banking goes, they just skipped the traditional banking and went straight from barter to Bitcoin. How about that? I mean, I would love to see it. Like, you know, not, not even just from uh, having access to those services to, to help individuals' lives, but just to have those services build on something sound like Bitcoin also just has all the secondary beneficial effects of a stable sound money relatively speaking versus inflationary paper like it's and it's you know i mean that's it's such a massive problem to tackle like it's it's really truly paycheck to paycheck poor people don't have money to invest in Bitcoin. They don't have ways to do it. They have other shit to deal with. Like the lack of conventional infrastructure makes it hard to even get that Bitcoin circulating in in those areas or communities or populations. So it's like, how do you really do that? And then on top of it, if you can do that, just keeping transactional costs cheap enough. So if, if, if he really has or can come up with you know, ways to actually attack those problems and then really attack them. Like, that would be amazing to see. Yeah, I just hope that, you know, whether it's just him personally doing stuff or with Square Crypto or whatever, I hope it's not, I hope it doesn't turn into like a Facebook type move where they create infrastructure like, hey, you can access the internet now, but you have to do it through Facebook. I like hope they don't do that well i so. mean you have to remember like they have square just the general payment processor 
Cash App with the tighter Bitcoin integration and then Square Crypto. And that like Square Crypto is an entirely separate like open source thing. Like it's not part of Square or Cash App. So, I mean, like for all we know, like, it, you know, I mean, this could have nothing to do with Cash App or Square. This, this could just be like really use Square Crypto to drive the open infrastructure to, to make that happen instead of just try to play like I'm the big Western company open up. Yeah, I just I hope that's clear from, you know, intended or not, it should be clear from the beginning that. You know, you have Bitcoin, which is an open, permissionless, decentralized network, and then you have companies around it who are running the infrastructure and maybe offering services, but they are, because like a lot of people in these areas, they think of Facebook as being the internet. That's their only experience and exposure to the internet, and so we should be careful that whether it's Square or any of these companies or someone else, like make sure that that doesn't happen with bitcoin stuff Mm -hmm. you know i'm 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 gonna i'm cautiously optimistic with how like his whole foray into this space has been so far like i'm I'm not gonna say oh blind fanboy nothing but uh the good way can happen but I'm, i'm optimistic but uh yeah i guess that's uh that's it for the day if nobody else has anything else to add on that no, just a good luck square crypto, man. Yeah, I want to see that succeed. All right, so final thoughts time. Who's ready first? I'll go just because I was like actually thinking about just final thought and what I was doing right before this because uh, I'd mentioned it. Um, I think I'd mentioned it before I left and mentioned a tweet about that uh, here in Colorado we're building this uh, special purpose depository and there's this uh, working group. And I was just on a conference call before this uh, recording with the uh, like with a group of people working with the government, but also industry people. And we were all listening to the Colorado Banking Commission talking about the way that they view blockchain companies and the way that they view uh, the idea of banking blockchain companies or any company to do with blockchain, cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin. And they were saying how it's all just, uh, you know, it's just. It's a little too uh, too risky, and there's not enough economic incentive to actually study the infrastructure to uh, to build out uh, some sort of service for these companies. Like, there's got to be enough. Uh, what is this? He says there's got to be enough return and resources along with the risk. And uh, the state regulators view the uh, risk of depositing uh, crypto. You know, it's relatively low if you have low percentage of your holdings in cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin, where the more of your holdings that you have in cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin, the higher compliance issues you're going to have, which I guess that's kind of a given. But, uh, you know, I've just turned the whole discussion back over to uh, cannabis because uh, that's the main thing that this uh, there's nobody. It's not like being just said that this is a special purpose bank for the cannabis industry. I mean, this is a special purpose depository that's going to be used for censored markets. But for Colorado, it's very evident that that is the cannabis industry. And so, uh, yeah, you know, we're moving forward with that. Like they're, they're, uh, taking the working group and putting it into subgroups and hopefully we'll have some legislation coming together by the end of January to where, uh, it's possible that, you know, the cannabis industry will be able to bank themselves on uh, Bitcoin and, uh, hopefully, you know, we can see that sort of thing moving forward here in Colorado in the relatively near future, because I know that, uh, they like when I was replying on Twitter about this subject, it was because uh, Ragnar and some uh, other Bitcoiners uh, were talking about, you know, we need more ways to spend Bitcoin. We need closed loop economies. And uh, this is something that I think uh, we're going to be able to build out in an official capacity here in Colorado for an actual censored market. And, um, you know, just trying to think of like whenever Bitcoin passes 100K, how are you going to sell people that it's going to get to a million? It's like we need real economic markets on this network. It's going to happen. Yeah, that'd be fucking awesome, man. Hell yeah. So uh going to keep working on that too. Mm-hmm. All right, Janine, beep boop, load thought. Um, So I actually forgot I would 
forgot to make it one of the stories, but one of the things that I think we should follow up on is um, a couple episodes ago we mentioned the Unknown Fund, which is the supposed uh, honeypot of money that uh, supposedly if you're a a privacy-focused or somehow impacting Bitcoin privacy project, you could apply for a grant um, I don't know how official of a grant it is, but basically you get you could get a donation in exchange for working on privacy stuff in Bitcoin and uh, I guess other cryptocurrencies. And as far as I know, I haven't heard of anyone actually getting any money or like I'm still not even sure if the money exists. So I don't don't know what's happening there, but I, you know. Yeah, I don't know what the game is, um, so I would just be careful if you know you're thinking of applying to that. Just be aware that they, as far as I know, they don't have a track record yet of actually doing anything. So you might want to be careful. I don't know what the risks are of you know if you're telling them, especially about a project that isn't public or it's something you're thinking about and you're looking for funding. Um, I don't know what the risk might be of them kind of just running this thing in order to get ideas and run with them themselves and not give credit to the people who are thinking that they're just submitting an application for a grant or donation type thing. But yeah, just something to look out for. We're not, it doesn't look yet like we can trust this thing. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you know anything else is uh, clarified with that, we'll probably go into a little more detail formally with it. And I guess um, uh, you got more. Yeah, I was just gonna say because uh, Rick, are you planning to come back on more episodes now, or is this just a drive-by? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm going to come back uh, on some more episodes. Might uh, still miss one or two in between, just trying to get all this stuff in order. Cool. Yeah, because I was just going to say, like, in case you weren't going to be back for any in between now and the holidays, the holidays are coming up, and we still have at least uh, another two weeks or so of doing episodes, assuming scheduling stuff doesn't get in the way. So, uh, yeah, if anyone else is not going to be able to watch, I uh, hope you have a good uh, holiday coming up. If, you know, Block Dash Digest is too much. Show. No, not dash. Please don't. If it's don't, block it, don't digest dash intervals through the snow. lengthen. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But I no. no, I don't. I don't want to dash through the snow. I don't. I don't. I don't want to use dash. No, I'm just making fun of the fact that it's like everywhere you go now, you hear Christmas music. It's crazy. Stop! I will kill you if anything gets stuck in my head. Okay. Oh, it, uh, it's gonna happen. No, no. Okay. Uh, my so, final thought: time to drive the song out ahead. Head. Nope. Nope. Uh, ah, what? Ah, Dashing through the snow. Sh- I'm, gonna gonna kill you. I'm actually going to fucking kill you. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, I've got another final thought before yours. I've got to oh, remember to uh, not talk as much because listening back to the episodes, I was like, yeah, Jan- you know, Janine, you, uh, I need to let you talk more because like I was listening back to the episodes and I was like, man, Janine is a freaking powerhouse smart person talking to, and like I'm usually talking over you. So I'm going to. Uh, yeah, I'll be coming back on, but I'm going to be, like, uh, giving you the mic a lot. No, it is such a struggle. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> Final thought. Uh, actually go listen to that fucking interview with Nick Carter and the head of Circle's OTC desk. One last little spoiler on that. The second biggest OTC desk in the country, Circle's, literally grew out of just like hedging supply to sell Bitcoin to retail customers and accidentally exploding into the most profitable part of their business. So like go listen to that interview. You will learn all kinds of fun little things about the history of the the market in this space. But on that note, uh, until next time, catch you later, punks. Bye. Later, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>
Красный или сорок морял.